So folks, in 2024, uh, closing the turnout gap uh, for eligible citizens with situational barriers to voting, uh, you know, it, it, it could make the difference. In fact, I think it will make the difference um, in this election. So today I'm going to be joined by three voting champions. These individuals are not just experts in the work they're doing, but they're passionate about it. Uh, and they're going to discuss with us how to close that turnout gap for formerly incarcerated citizens with people uh, with disabilities and overseas Americans and the obstacles that stand between them and the ballot box, as well as the barriers that a lot of our neighbors, friends, and families face here at home. Lewis Reed is not only well-versed in the voter re restoration process, he is one of the nation's more charismatic advocates for criminal justice reform. In fact, having served nearly 14 years in federal prison, he knows of what he speaks. He has worked with Jay-Z's Reform Alliance, as well as Van Jones and Jessica Jackson's Dream Corps. So he is in the game trying to change uh, the game for uh felons and restoring their rights to vote. Michelle Bishop is the voter access and engagement manager for the National Disability Rights Network, the federally mandated protection and advocacy organization for individuals with disabilities. Michelle partners with civil rights groups in Washington, D.C. to protect voting rights and election access for, for those in the disabled community. And my good friend uh, and CEO of uh, the organization I happen to chair, um, U.S. Vote Foundation, Susan Sunan is the founder, president, and CEO of U.S. Vote Foundation and Overseas Vote Foundation. She has been recognized as a foremost expert on overseas voting uh, through her congressional testimony and her pioneering work in this field. She is the one who brought tech to voting. Uh, I'm excited to have all three of them on this uh, voting barbershop edition of the Michael Steele podcast coming up right after this. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. I I'm very excited about our conversation today because... Um, you know me, I like to, to bring in folks who know what the hell they're talking about and have an appreciation for not just uh, the dynamics of the thing they're in, but how everything around it is impacted by what they do um, and what others are doing. And in the voting space, um, as you know, um, my particular passion is every voter get out there and vote. Everyone has a civic responsibility. But this, it's a confusing landscape, sometimes deliber deliberately made uh, so by our elected officials, <laughs> yet we keep electing them. But that's another conversation. Um, the reality of it is the landscape is changing. Um, laws are changing. Uh, the rules of engagement are changing. And the ability to access uh, the ballot box is changing. Um, and it's not just changing for grandma and granddad, but it's changing for uh, individuals who are coming uh, back uh, into society after spending time in prison. It's changing for members of our disabilities community. Um, and we need to know what, what the new landscape looks like, uh, what the leaders in these areas are doing. And I'm really very, very excited to welcome Susan, Lewis, and Michelle uh, to the podcast. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, so I, folks, I, I do uh, what I like to call barbershops um, in politics. And, you know, Lewis understand what I'm talking about when you walk up exactly. to the barbershop and yeah, yeah, yeah. the fellas are, you know, <laughs> just sitting there and, you know, I don't know if I really came in for a haircut today or the conversation, but I'm here, you know, kind of deal. So yeah. this is this is the vibe that I'm looking for here is um, having the three of you on. Um, Lewis uh, is a well-known, well-regarded advocate for criminal justice re reform and certainly uh, in the space of giving ballot access uh, to, to felons um, and as well as um, those who um, are in the system to sort of 
get themselves together and back on the street, if you if you will. Then you've got the work that you're doing, Michelle, with the members of our disabilities community, um, making sure that their abilities are avail their ability to access the ballot box um, is uh, as much a part of their day as anything else in, in terms of how they access that. And the work that you're doing, Susan, I'm very familiar with. We work together. Um, I chair the board of US Vote. Um, and and the idea that um, every citizen is a voter. So that means the encapsulation of everybody who um, meets that that standard in the law uh, for eligibility. Okay, I'm eligible, I'm 18, let's go do it. How I wanna get from each of you a sense of what you do, what you're doing right now and then we can sort of expand it out to what does the landscape look like as we are five months from an election. So I'll start with you, Lewis. Um, yes. When I was Lieutenant Governor, I spent uh, a lot of time working in this space in Maryland, um, trying to figure out ways in which we could, um, not just through advocacy, but actual change, mm -hmm. um, create a pathway for, for felons to be reintroduced in society um, whole, right, uh, and and create an environment for them that um, will allow them to progress, not regress. And and part of that discussion, it was really the first time for me to sort of focus on this idea of their constitutional rights um, and the fact that. Um, you know, a lot of felons, uh, most felons, when they come out, and a lot of it's kind of driven by state laws, but also, um, you know, sometimes you can get into a federal, federal trap that they don't have all their rights restored. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your work, what you're what you're doing right now, and advocating yeah. for. Well, look, I, I appreciate being on, and, and thank you so much. First and foremost, before I get into what I'm doing, I should probably talk about what it is that I've done. Uh, specifically speaking that I served 14 years in federal prison. Mm -hmm. And while I was incarcerated, there was one of three things that happened with me. Uh, and I also realized that those closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but often furthest from resources and power, like my good friend, Glenn E. Martin likes to say. And I have been involved in this space for a number of years, having supported and or led the passage of more than 30 bills across this country, including the Federal First Step Act that has to date released more than 30,000 people from federal prisons. So I just wanted to point to personal privilege in that regard. More specifically about what I'm currently doing, I'm the executive vice president of the Douglas Project, which is an organization that in effect does one of three things. We bridge the gap between people who are currently incarcerated and those who are in free society. And mm -hmm. we do that through conversation. We do that through connection. And we also do do that through community as well. Uh, and I'm just you know, really ecstatic about being uh, on today and being able to have the, the topic of conversation that we are having specifically around voter enfranchisement for those that block of demographic of people who are justice impacted. Are, are, is that work, is that a state-by-state state effort? Is, is there a federal component to that as well? How, how, how does that lay out when you're looking at the country and you have a state like Florida that's trying to constrict uh, that access? Uh, you have other states that are trying to expand it. So I assume there's that level, but is there, is there more to it than what people may realize? Yeah, there's absolutely more to it than what people may realize. Looks more specifically, uh, my good friend uh, Desmond Mead, who's Justice Impact and who led the Florida Rights uh, Coalition uh, uh, initiative in order to be able to re-enfranchise people who in the state of Florida have been locked out of opportunities. I want you to think about this, Michael. People who are justice impacted, they've been locked up they get released from incarceration and now they're locked out of opportunity. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the collateral consequences in terms of employment, housing, uh, and all of those other things, right? We're talking about constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. And so it's more specifically when we think about Florida, we have over 900,000 individuals, not over 900,000 people who by constitution, based off of uh, 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 an amendment, uh, or, or, or voting referendum, I should say, they have had their rights restored, but now there's a barrier, an additional barrier, such as fines and fees that prevent these people from voting. 
in my mind, you know, quite frankly, the, this, these are the black coats that have been uh, remixed, so to speak. Right. right. We've gone from Jim Crow to now James Crow Esquire, where he's more sophisticated. He's more, he wears a Brooks Brothers suit and he has more degrees than a thermometer. But the fact of the matter is that there's, there, there, there are the old tactics that have been used in order to be able to lock us out of, uh, out of, out of uh, the vote. So uh, I'm just curious, you, you said something that's very curious about. So what, what are the fees and fines that, you, that <laughs> are related to folks voting? Great, great, great question. So think about this. Florida, a few years ago, they voted in order to be able to have the rights of people who are justice impacted restored, the voting rights of people right. who are justice impacted restored. And then the, the powers that be, uh, they came and they said, well, wait, hold up. If you have an outstanding fine or fee, you cannot, you you are ineligible from voting. Gotcha. So you can't vote even if you are justice impacted, if you have a felony conviction until you get these, these things cleared up. Now gotcha. you have to consider this, especially since this is barbershop talk, right? Yeah. You got folks who are in Florida that can't even afford to pay attention. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, and when you think about bills and the, and the priorities of uh, of bills, I got to pay some folks got to pay child support. Some folks, some folks got to pay their cell phone bills, so on and so forth. Right. You think that uh, paying a fine and fee is going to be high on a priority list uh, uh, in order to no. get their voting rights reenfranchised? I mean, it's just absolutely asinine. And it's one of those things where they know. And when I say they, I'm talking about the folks who uh, don't look like us, don't, don't right. come from where we come from, who understand how powerful our voting block is in this country. Um, they try to lock black, brown and poor white people out of the vote. And yeah. one of the ways that they do that is through economic disenfranchisement that's compounded by voter disenfranchisement. I'm glad you said I, in, in your list and it's something that people don't get. And I and I say this to a lot of my white brothers and sisters, y'all need to pay attention to your own because there are a whole lot of poor white folks out there uh, who are on the same boat as black and brown people. And so when you're doing all these things that you think are gonna cut off the opportunity for, for black and brown, you're also cutting off the opportunity for your own because Without question. They, they can't access the system the same way we can't access the system, right? And a yeah. lot of people, you know, I had one friend of mine say, well, but they're white. And I'm like, yeah, but they po. <laughs> <laughs> so, which, which I'm, makes us all family. Thank you. That makes us all family. Oh, Trump's white and all every time, every time. So, Michelle, tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the disability space because that's another area where, unlike what Lewis is running into, where people are kind of blocking and tackling him, trying out of position in terms of getting access to the ballot box for felons. You have a lot of folks who still don't get the the difficulty people who are disabled have <laughs> getting to the ballot. So it's not a question of, 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 you know, doing too much. They're not really doing anything in some cases. And, and so how tell us a little bit about your work and what's happening in that space. Well, that's absolutely right. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm the manager for voter access and engagement at an organization called the National Disability Rights Network. So this is what we do. We're a membership association. I'm based in the DC area, but we have disability rights organizations in every state, district, and territory in the US. And they are all mandated by the federal government to work on access to the vote for people with disabilities. So this is something that we know a lot about. Uh, and it's, it's exactly how you describe it. When I'm asked very often what barriers exist for people with disabilities who are trying to ask, access their vote. And the, the honest answer is every single touch point in the electoral process that a voter has, has some sort of barrier, right? Registering yep. to vote traditionally means, you know, getting to a library or an elections office that may, may not be accessible or have accessible transit. And then getting a piece of paper you might not be able to read and fill out. We do that online now, but if those websites aren't designed to be accessible, then people with disabilities can't do that online. Uh, when we talk about voting in person, the majority of polling places in the United States are not fully accessible to people with disabilities, despite the fact that the Americans with Disabilities Act is over 30 years old. We have failed to solve that problem. As you said, 
it's that we're not doing enough very often, right? Mm -hmm. The law exists and we're not doing enough to make sure we comply with it. When we talk about getting into the polling place and there are supposed to be accessible voting systems there for your use and sometimes they're not there or they haven't been set up or the poll workers haven't been trained on them. When we talk about voting absentee and voting by mail and that often means traditionally being mailed a piece of paper that isn't necessarily accessible to you if you can't handle paper, if you can't read or mark that paper. Uh, So at every point in the process, uh, there's barriers that exist that we have failed to really make fully accessible for people with disabilities. So it it really spans the the entire system. How do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, how, how, how does, okay. So I, I was intrigued by the idea of you have someone who um, is unable to actually leave their home, so they request a ballot be sent to them. The ballot comes, but then they've got the the added problem of manipulating that ballot, meaning, okay, folks, don't y'all freak out because I use the word manipulation and ballot in the same sentence, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I mean, being able to physically, you know, turn the page, so... Because I got, you know, you get some people out in the audience, they just kind of go, oh, my God, see, I told you they were trying to fix the election. No, but the reality of it is you've got people who cannot physically, you know, mark the ballot or or read it or whatever. What are some of the tools that your organization tries to level up for them, um, either through the system itself or individually for them to be able to access that ballot completely and and actually mark their choice and send it back in. It's that's actually a really important question that you're asking because under federal law, every eligible voter has the right to a ballot that is independent and private. So anytime you have to ask someone to assist you to mark your ballot and they, you have to tell them who you want to vote for, they can see who you want to vote for. That is a violation uh, of your federal rights. We have to be able to make sure that the private the private and the independent ballot is protected for everyone. And I think that's a really important feature of our electoral process, because anytime the secrecy of your ballot is compromised, uh, there's a security risk there. Anytime you can't vote completely privately and independently, we can't guarantee that your ballot is being marked the way that you intend or being submitted properly to be counted. And I think there's actually some good solutions out there. I'm excited to be on with Susan, who knows a lot about that working with military and overseas voters. Uh, We often are able to send them their ballots electronically. Uh, For most of a lot of our military and overseas voters, I would imagine Susan could tell us more, are in situations where it's hard to reliably mail it to them. Right. And so they're able to receive it and mark it electronically. That coincidentally also solves a lot of accessibility issues for people with disabilities, whether or not they're overseas or stateside, because it eliminates some of that paper handling uh, that we're not able to do. It eliminates the need to be able to read and mark a piece of paper if you can have it read to you uh, through your screen reader so you can hear it um, hear it through a headset the same way we see that happen in polling places. Right, uh, right. People who are blind and low vision and it gives you different ways to mark the ballot. If you're not able to use a keyboard or a mouse, there's all types of technology that folks can use. So there are ways to absolutely make even some of those really old processes that we have like vote by mail ballots much more accessible. We just have to, and they they exist, we have them. Uh, we're using them for other types of voters. If we just leverage them for people with print disabilities, it can make a huge difference. Wow. So that that brings bring me brings me to my friend Susan, who um, it, it's actually I you know she's going to hate I'm going to say this, but uh, <laughs> she 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 is a pioneer in many regards to um, creating uh, what you were just re- referencing, uh, Michelle, uh, access to the ballot for our men and women who serve in in uniform overseas, uh, which then grew out to. Um, uh, expats who are living abroad but still hold, hold their American citizenship and want to participate in that, um, and then bringing it full circle to the work that U.S. Vote Foundation does at home. So we originally started as as the Overseas Vote, U.S. Overseas Vote Foundation, um, and that in combination when it was formed, what, 25 years or so ago, Susan, um, worked with DOD which was like, oh, wow, this is, you mean our, our men and women in uniform can actually vote? And, and they're like, yeah, and this is how they'll do it. 
um, to what we're what we're seeing today. So, Susan, tell us about uh, both U.S. Vote Overseas Vote Foundation and and the U.S. Vote Foundation because you're what you're doing taps into both what Lewis and Michelle are doing and how that impacts uh, the entire e voting ecosystem. Okay, well, thank you, Michael. What an amazing group. <laughs> I'm really honored to be with you all. And um, I almost don't know where to start. <laughs> Some of the things you said, Lewis, I wanna chime in on and likewise, Michelle. So hopefully I get around to that. Um, but yes, Michael, thank you first and full disclosure for serving as our Chairman, for all these years, it's a pleasure to work with you. Yeah, I'm very we, we, we do good stuff out there. <laughs> we do. So we are very busy and we do have a lot of websites. In fact, we have three. <laughs> uh, overseas Vote is what we started with. And I'd love it for all the overseas voters out there traveling, going to school, working, whatever you're doing out there take a look at overseasvotefoundation.org because it's designed specifically for overseas voters and our uniformed services members and their families who all vote under the same program. Mm -hmm. So when I started like 20 years ago, I mean, that's kind of when the, the towers came down and I said, geez, I got to do something. I really came out of the uh, technology space, not politics, not voting, um, but I looked at the process. When I went to register to vote myself as an overseas voter, I was handed this blurry sepia print form on cardstock that you used to try to have to figure out how to fill out. It was just prone to error. We really studied all those errors before we designed them out of the system. Um, and it would the form would fold in half and then it would have a little tape thing and you just send it like that, like this piece of paper folded in half. But if you squeeze it, you know how you can squeeze it? Right. Look inside and see all the voters' private information. It wasn't very secure, put right. it that way. And the 500 page instruction book, well, let's just put it out, not very many people had access to it. And then the address is inside that book for where to send your form, 30% uh, of them were wrong, out of date. So. You know, being the tech person that I am, I kind of looked at it and went, wow, here's an opportunity to, you know, put this process online. And I ended up being the first person to ever do that. Now, back then, it was a little bit more complicated. But since then, our overseas and military voting process has been reformed. And uh, there was a, a Reform Act in 2009. And all states are required to make certain services available to overseas and military voters. But one of the really, there are a couple really key things. One is they all have to be able to send a blank ballot online. And you were mentioning that, Michelle. Mm -hmm. that, that really does speed up the process. So you get overseas voters and military conflict zones in countries like Mexico or Italy where the, email, where the post is really slow. Getting that blank ballot is great. It just cuts six weeks of travel time into a minute mm -hmm. or a second, really. The other thing is they have to be able to make those ballots available. They must be available by law, 45 days. That's six weeks ahead of the election. So if you're an overseas voter and you requested your ballot before six weeks prior to the election, on that day, you're going to get your ballot. Mm -hmm. So you have plenty of time to fill it out. Gives you more time to vote, more time to give it back. I have noticed that in the U.S. with U.S. domestic absentee balloting, it seems almost last minute to me. It's very late in the game. Yeah. People get their ballot a couple weeks ahead of time. And I know that there's interest on the candidates part. They don't want people voting too early before they can change your mind. But usually people kind of know what they want, you know. And so look at the honest truth is there's this massive what we call turnout gap of like 71%. Um, the overseas voting population is voting at less than 10% hmm. of the number of eligible voters. And there's a huge turnout gap, I know, uh, for voters with disabilities as well, and voters with um, that are involved in the criminal justice situation. Uh, Lewis, you were talking about Florida. 
I think it's important to point out to the public that approximately 10% of the eligible population, the voting eligible population in Florida is disenfranchised due to a past conviction. Now, a lot of them may com be completely fine and able to do it, but they need to pay these restitution fees, which include costs for court. I wonder what they charge for your court time. <laughs> um, yeah. Interesting. So Lewis is absolutely right. There are barriers put in front of those people to keep them from the ballot box, even though the law changed to allow them to get there. So that's a complete travesty of justice, a complete, and you know, 10%, just think of 10% of the population of any state suddenly was in franchise and really could vote. But in Florida being such a sort of, we don't know which way they're gonna go state, it's mm -hmm. really important. Um, okay, so going on, I do want to introduce you to one of our new uh, programs uh, I've mentioned the Overseas Vote site, and Michael, you've mentioned right. U.S. Vote Foundation. That's where all our moving parts services are. That's where the Voters with Disabilities Guide is. Thank you, Michelle, for your help on that. That's where our Voting Rights Restoration Guide is, state-by-state -state information. All that's on U.S. So, Vote Foundation. So let, so let me be clear. So on, on that site, um, in regarding the work that both Lewis and Michelle are doing, there's a section. So if I'm a felon and I'm trying to figure out in here, I'm sitting in Mississippi or I'm sitting in Maryland or I'm in Arkansas or California, yep. I can access the site and there's a, there's an area for someone like me in my situation. Absolutely. In fact, one of the things we have really focused on, we started with the overseas voter community but we've branched out to include now other groups that have special circumstances that keep them away from the ballot box, namely this voting rights restoration area, voters with disabilities. And what I want to show you, if you, yep. I hope you'll all hang with me. Yep. I just wanted to show you our new Yes campaign. And that is specifically designed to show you uh, to address these special circumstances it says it right here life is complicated but voting doesn't have to be we really you know a lot of the voting rights advocates um and people working to close the turnout gap are very focused on um the voting age population they look at the population in terms of age and demographics, right. like race demographics. But there's a whole other thing going on called circumstances that get in the way of voting. And these are voting eligible people that just can't vote because of their situation. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing about the Yes campaign was to ask, ask and answer the can I vote if questions. Uh, so this library of stories uh, is about eight different sets of stories. For Maybe example, that. absentee, vote right. by mail, it's described. And in each story, there is a can I vote question that we've answered. And there's an, in, there's an interview. Um, here we have the disability area. And I think uh, Michelle Bishop. There is she right is, here. there's Michelle. Yeah. And this is a great interview. I just reread it today. And I really was struck by some of the things that you said in here, Michelle. For example, one of the biggest barriers to voting with a disability is just that there are no parking spaces for you. I mean, that's just crazy. Things like that. Interesting. Well, <laughs> I mean, you, you know... figured they'd, they would have worked out the parking arrangement. <laughs> exactly. And then we've got Michelle overseas. is like, yeah, you'd think, right? <laughs> you would think, right. So all of these situations, I mean, these are very uh, specific situations, but there are a lot of them. There are about 30 different stories in here. And let me just say to your uh, listening audience that down here at the end of every interview, you've got links to things, but you also have a link to tell us your story. And we really invite 
other stories to come in to this library. So that's that's our website. We call it us.vote. That's a special domain that's just, just for campaigns that we're running. us.vote slash yes to get to this library of stories. And I really invite you all to go in there and see what these questions and answers are and let us know if you've got one to add. We'll be asking Lewis to put his story up soon. Yeah, okay. no, I, I think Lewis should definitely get Lewis's story up there because, um, you know, it, 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 we're talking about two real <laughs> sort of forgotten population of voters. Uh, and 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 there is there's politics related to felons voting. There's politics related to folks with disabilities voting, uh, especially um, as, as Michelle can probably tell you, with respect to getting access to the ballot in certain communities. But even when they get that access, being able to access the polling place itself, physically. Um, folks don't realize, um, and I'd like everybody to kind of jump in at this point. We got, we've got we set we've set the scene and we now know what we're, the parameters of what we're talking about. Folks don't realize that when a legislature for, because of its political peak um, with uh, the opposing political party, decides to exact retribution politically and say, all right, we have a hundred polling places across the city, across this particular community. We're gonna reduce it to 30. What that means for an elderly person, what that means for a disabled person to be able to now, instead of, you know, for example, walking two blocks, um, you know, to a polling place now has to take a 45 minute bus ride to their polling place, or they have to, you know, go to a new facility that is not accessible for them if they're disabled uh, for any any number of reasons. Talk about the the impact that recent changes in laws and, and even maybe some that are currently proposed um, are having on uh, those with felony records, um, those with disabilities. Um, and Susan, quite honestly, just everyday voters out there, you know, a mom and dad who have to, you know, uh, take off from work uh, to go vote uh, but now because of, you know, a change in the law, a quirk in the law, that becomes more of a po po problem for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, oh, sorry, Lewis. No, 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 I'm going to say one thing okay, that, about what you're talking about right now, Michael. Uh, I think it's very important for people to look at the different voting methods and options that are available to them. This whole issue of voting on Tuesday. So many people work and they can't get there in time. Like you're saying, there are fewer polling places. Um, there maybe aren't any more drop boxes. Uh, right. All these things. It's important to look at the different options you have. We have a service on usvotefoundation.org for voting methods and options. And it's state by state, tells you all the different ways that you could potentially vote in your state. So you might be able to vote by mail, by absentee ballot. You might be able to vote early. Think about taking advantage of those options so that you don't get stuck in that line or get stuck without being able to get to a polling place in time. Um, granted, not every state does allow voting by mail without some sort of excuse, they call it, or reason, but a lot of them do. And that might be the answer for you. And all the services to generate a ballot request online, they're on the site as well. Everything that takes you up to that point of voting, we have for you and we have a help desk and don't hesitate. So that's my pitch. No, that's good. That's an important pitch. Lewis, you were, you were about to say, yeah, I was going to, you know, just raise for consideration one of the things that wasn't uh, necessarily mentioned. You talk, We talked about people who have disabilities 
Um, and when we shrink from 100 down to 30 precincts and the accessibility there in terms of transportation, uh, folks overseas, let's talk about the psychological uh, you know, uh, mm. barriers. Mm -hmm. When people who are just as impacted, let's say, for instance, if you take a precinct out of one neighborhood and you, in effect, put that precinct in another neighborhood, let's talk about racial profiling, right? If that precinct is in a neighborhood where black, brown and poor white folks and or people with justice impacted who now have uh, th what I consider the new PTSD, prison traumatic stress disorder. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to that neighborhood because I know when I go to that neighborhood, there's one of several things that's going to happen. Either I may be racially profiled by law enforcement. Maybe it's in a situation where, you know, I might be microaggressed, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, against w from the people who are actually working those precincts. There are a lot of psychological implications that actually come when you shrink. You, uh, 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 precincts from the number that you talked about, right. for example, from 100 down to 30. I want to give you another uh, uh, just point for consideration as well. I was thinking about something. I had a conversation with someone who's in Alabama. And in Alabama, people who are justice impacted, all individuals must pay fines and fees and restitutions before regaining their voting rights, Create in which, as you know, creates significant financial barriers. And shout out to the Fines and Fees Justice Center, who is doing remarkable work specifically on reducing those barriers. But I talked to a friend of mine who's in Alabama, and for the first time, he's now off of supervision. He served his time uh, in, in prison. He is you know, crossing on the green, uh, mm -hmm. and not in between. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, and, and what he told me was that he cannot pay, uh, he cannot, he's ineligible to vote. Keep in mind, Michael, he's been looking forward to voting for the first time in his 40 plus years in life. He is still ineligible to vote because he has fees. Guess what those fees are? He <laughs> has easy pass fees. No. Easy pass fees that are outstanding. He has easy pass fees that are outstanding. <laughs> and so in the state of Alabama, fines, fees, and restitutions, the fees are not specific to court-related fees. Uh, I was going to say, fees, so they, they tag you on non-court-related fees that on you may have? On non-court-related fees. Non-court-related fees. He has... He has paid his, all fees and fines and restitutions related to his offense. He's paid the fees for his public defender fees. He's paid the fees to, to be on supervision, to get off of supervision. I mean, this man has paid more fees than a little bit. And he has fees. He has outstanding. He has probably about $300 in outstanding easy pass fees. And when he went to go register to vote, they said, you have easy pass fees. You think about that. And so when we talk about th this voting block, back to our earlier discussion, we're, we're, I just want to give some, some st statistics for our very uh, intellectual and astute uh, audience, our listening and viewing audience. In the United States of America, there are more than 70 million people who have criminal convictions. 70 million people. We have a voting block that's approximately 15 million that are still not engaged in democracy. That has to do with the financial barriers, that has to do with legislative barriers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that has to do with uh, 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 informational barriers where, you know, for example, in, uh, in Nevada in 2019, they restored the rights of more than 75,000 people um, who were, you know, uh, uh, felony disenfranchised, but the awareness of the restoration of those uh, of, of such uh, just was not in the public domain. Um, so you have approximately 70, 77,000 people in Nevada that are currently locked out of the vote. Why? Not because they can't vote, just because awareness is not out there that they can now re-engage in the process. And that that is such an important aspect of, of all of this, which is why the, what, the work each of you are doing um, is so important. It is not just, oh, we're trying to, you know, straighten out the process and, and clean it up and, and make it better, but it is also creating levels of awareness that within your respective communities, and certainly for you, Susan, more broadly, um, there are a lot of people who just don't know um, how, you know, what their rights are, number one, 
what the rules are, which actually in many cases are working in their favor, right? Um, despite some 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 places where they try to change the rules because they they don't want certain groups to vote. Um, but by and large, there's a there's a larger landscape of information that people just don't know about or have awareness of. And I think this is probably true, Michelle, in what you may encounter people because they're disabled and we and we can get, we kind of get it with the felon community who will probably say you know I just I, you know I'm a felon I I don't have any rights they you know they strip me bare and they make it harder for me to to get back in the game um in in the system um and so they that those are particular battles that Lewis is dealing with every day with on that front but in the disabilities community there probably is this mindset that, you know, because I'm disabled, I can't vote. Right. I mean, it's just like I, I there there is no access for me. Yeah. I, I mean, like you said, I don't even have a parking spot. <laughs> what, what, what what you know, so if I don't have a parking spot, then, then there's there's probably going to be little regard inside that building for my ability to access my ballot. So therefore, I'm just not going to participate or I don't have anyone to help me participate. Well, it sends a message, doesn't it? If we have had an electoral process for as long as we've had a United States and it's never been made accessible to you, the right. message is that your voice is not wanted here and that you're not a part of this process. And there are folks who try really hard to participate. And at some point they don't come back if they haven't been successful, we lose votes that way. It perpetuates that gap in voter participation. But I'm also, as we're having this conversation, I'm thinking, and it's a barbershop conversation, right? Yeah. We're, we're having this, so, so I want to back it all the way up. I'm, I'll give you the beauty shop version um, and back it all the way up yeah. and look. At we, the, the other side of the room is beauty shop. This is the barbershop side. Yeah, the other side barber is barbershop, yeah. Shop. There we go. Right? Exactly, exactly. And our, when we talk about the the populations that we serve, there is a lot of um, intersectionality between them, right? We're not necessarily talking about distinct groups of voters. Um, a lot of the issues that we experience overlap, right? And as I'm hearing Lewis talking, and I'm thinking about this is where this is where we're going to get into the the realness, the barbershop conversation. When I think about people who experience incarceration. Um, I think we all know in the United States, to a large extent, we lock up people who we don't want to see and people who we don't want to deal with. And that includes people with disabilities. We often, we have a long history in the United States of locking up people with mental illness rather than spending the money on effective community supports mm -hmm. for them to live successfully in the community. Incarceration itself creates disabilities. If nothing else, talking about PTSD, right? PTSD, depression, anxiety from the conditions inside jails and prisons, or the fact that you can't access quality care so that one minor illness or injury turns into a lifelong chronic condition uh, because it wasn't treated appropriately at the time that it presented itself. So there's a lot of overlap between our communities. When I think about our military and overseas voters, our military voters, first of all, unfortunately, very often experience disability uh, because they are exposed to dangerous conditions. But when we talk about, you know, providing access for maybe someone who can't use a paper ballot, someone who's blind, I think we very often think that that person's at home. And what do we just need to get them at home? But what if that blind person works overseas, right? We're not always mm. just at home. There's there's so much overlap <laughs> between all our communities. I think as the more we talk about what we're seeing right now, especially what we're seeing legislatively, I think it recognizes all of those communities. And that's what's so sophisticated about the barriers that we're erecting now. You talked about closing polling places in communities. And we've seen a trend where uh, those poll closures are blamed on people with disabilities. Elections officials will say, we had to close these polling places because they're not accessible. They don't comply with the ADA. First of all, people with disabilities would never ask you to do that, right? That doesn't make it more accessible for literally anyone, let alone our voters. We don't make polling places accessible by closing them. We make them accessible by making them accessible, 
Mm-hmm. And there are many ways to do that. Not and not which all of which are very expensive. We talked about the parking issue. It's amazing what you can do with orange traffic cones and temporary signage to make accessible parking. <laughs> <laughs> a door is too heavy. You can just prop it open, right? right. There's cords on the floor. Tape them down, right? They can put up a portable ramp. It's not that complicated. But what we see is that these polling place closures are happening in places where black and brown people vote. Right. There's right. no way that's a coincidence, right? right? We wouldn't ask you to close those polling places. You're blaming us for the closures, but you're stopping black and brown people from voting. If it looks like voter suppression and it smells like voter suppression, it is it voter is suppression. Voter suppression. Yeah, okay. We're seeing an increase in laws that pr- limit who can assist you to cast your ballot. You should have the private and independent ballot, but you do have the right to the assistant of your choice if you need it. It's in the Voting Rights Act that people with limited English proficiency and people with disabilities have the right to the assistant of their choice. The only limitation on that is it can't be your employer or your union rep. But other than that, it's anyone you want. We're seeing laws coming up in the states that say, you know, only a friend or a family member can assist you or only the staff in a long term care facility. They only they can assist you or they're not allowed to assist you. Those types of laws, they have a chilling effect on the ability of people with disabilities to get the assistance they need to cast their ballots, especially people who live in long-term care facilities where access can be a really tricky issue. But I think that there is a component there as well. If we criminalize people who work in long-term care facilities, assisting disabled residents to vote, the person who's going to be prosecuted for a crime is not the person with a disability who needed assistance. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the person who works in that facility who assisted them. And when we talk about people who work in long-term care facilities, we are statistically talking about women of color. Mm. And that's who will be convicted of a crime, right? And so it's there is a very complex game of chess going on right now with voter suppression. It's it's gets the more we root out one way that it's done and put a stop to that, it just comes up in another venue, right? And it gets more and more complex. And we're very often seeing right now access for people with disabilities being pitted against other types of voters being used to suppress the votes of others or who we think are others, because to be honest, a lot of those folks have disabilities, right? There's an overlap in our communities, but what we're seeing is that it's getting more complex. Uh, And we really have to take an an intersectional approach to how we ensure access for all voters. Uh, And it's about all of us working together, right? It's about folks like me and Lewis and Susan being in a room together and talking about what our voters are experiencing. So we can make sure that we're, we're taking down all those barriers where we see them. We're having a great conversation about your rights and access to the ballot box uh, with uh, Susan and Lewis and Michelle. We're going to take a quick break and when we come back, uh, want to want to apply everything to the landscape before us over the next five months. Um, what where there are opportunities, where there's still some pitfall for voters um, as we get ready for what will be the most uh, important seminal uh, vote that we've probably seen in generations. Uh, we'll be right back right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the Michael Steele Podcast. So if you haven't been able to get your vote on, we've got the folks who can help you do that. Whether you are a felon who's working his or her way back into society and paying all the damn fees, um, or you're a person with disabilities is trying to figure out how you're going to access the ballot box or someone who just got the call to to work overseas, or you're actually serving overseas. We've got some wonderful guests here uh, to help us walk through it. Uh, so welcome back, Louis, uh, Michelle, and Susan. What What is the um, the current state of things from each of your perspectives five months out? Um, and and I'll, start, I'll start with you, uh, Louis, in terms of where you have states that where you have obviously felons who have serious crimes, rape, murder, they're likely uh, not uh, granted their right uh, to vote again. But otherwise, that that space is is available. I mean, it's a more open space for a felon, um, despite some of the difficulties we talked about. Uh, are there states that are coming online that are more and more green lighting? Uh, the not just the return uh, to society for for felons, but their full constitutional ability to to vote um, in that society. 
Yeah, I think that the, you know, a larger question here is that I don't think that we can cherry pick offenses. Uh, I think that the moment that we get into cherry picking more serious offenses or convictions versus less serious convictions, we run into a very, very nuanced gray area as to those people can have it, but these people can't. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to, if we're going to re-enfranchise people who are justice impacted, number one, we need to humanize the experiences of people who are incarcerated. Let me, let me say this, Michael, in the 14 years that I was incarcerated, I never met a felon. I never met an inmate. I never met an ex-con. I met brothers, uncles, aunties, cousins, baby mamas, baby, baby mm -hmm. daddies, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the folks who went to barbershop <laughs> understand that. <laughs> understand that colloquial term. You, you, then, you met everybody. <laughs> I met a, a, a body, a, a, a body, right? But the one thing that I never met, I never met, I never met the pejorative that the system assigned to us. Uh, in terms of, you know, felon, the, the labels that they assign to us. And so I think that, number one, we need to recondition ourselves as to understanding that the people who are justice impacted in our communities are, are now a part of our communities. So now that we are here, how do we effectively help them reintegrate into our communities, which is a conversation for another uh, episode, mm -hmm. but... But specifically around around you know uh, uh, voting uh, reenfranchisement, how can we in effect espouse the founding principles of this country? Dignity, equality, and justice, not for some people, not for the affluent in Greenwich, Connecticut, or not for the uh, those who are impoverished in, in Compton, California but for all people in the United States of America. If you have served your time in this country, if you are, you don't even have to be a tax paying citizen. If you are a citizen of the United States of America, then there is nothing that should lock you out of the ballot box after you have been locked up in an institution. And so there are initiatives, you know, uh, via states that are making strides. Uh, interestingly enough, Vermont and, and Maine um, that I think demographically it's inarguable that they right <laughs> that they don't necessarily look like right, <laughs> right. exactly that they look like where I come from right they're super progressive they allow people who are incarcerated to vote while they are while they are incarcerated and so I think that what we should be doing is we should be looking at people who are American citizens as, as such. And I'm, I'm, I'm also glad, I'll, I'll say this just as a PS as well. I'm also glad that, and, and I'm not happy, I'm not reveling in the fact that the former president is now uh, in this- uh, in, in, in this, this situation. situation. <laughs> yeah, in this situation. But I am glad that it's raising the conversation and it's now raising the consciousness because the same parties that locked people like Lewis L. Reed out of the vote is now have, they now have to reconsider now that you have the former president who Being is a convicted felon, felon, right? Yeah, who's now in the fraternity. In the fraternity. I bet you he never thought he'd be in that fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> He's now in the fraternity of folks like uh, folks like me and my cousins and, and the people that I was incarcerated with. Now, what are we going to do? Now, it's not an issue of they versus us. Now, it's we have a problem. Now, how are we going to unlock these opportunities for all Americans, not necessarily making this exclusive for some Americans? And well, so that, I'm glad that we're having this conversation. That, that raises an interesting point, though, because, uh, you know, unlike the work that that Susan does, where not only does she have a blindfold on, but she has earplugs in and her hands tied behind her back when it comes to party identification and, and party uh, ballot access, Republican versus Democrat. Um, but in your space, what you find is there is, and you touched on it a little bit, there, there is this other element that drives it. So for example, when you're looking at um, the resistance to uh, allowing felons uh, to regain their constitutional right to vote. Um, statistics shows that for, that felons are four times uh, as likely as non-felons to be Democrats. 
uh, and or and or politically unaffiliated. Um, and roughly only 20% of those felons will identify themselves as Republicans. So given the 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 partisan fueled environment that we're in, a lot of what's driving this anti felon uh, reintegration into uh, the full capacity of citizenship uh, is the fact that, oh, well, we just don't need more Democrats. And you've heard in the past, in places like Florida, for example, um, and a few other states where they specifically identify that as a reason not to uh, engage on this subject because it will basically allow more Democrats on the voting rolls than Republicans. Not only is that just a full out BS argument, because at the end of the day, you just don't know how someone is going to register and why should you care? That's that's something that, you know, gets played out at the ballot box. I know a lot of Republicans who vote Democrat and a lot of Democrats who vote Republican. So party affiliation and registration for me as a former party official never really meant that much, which is why I always emphasize the value of the message, the value of the policies we're offering. But that does shape your landscape a lot in terms of the work you're doing, because you have that obstacle where people are laying on top of not only the criminal conviction, but now the assumption of party affiliation that drives their ability to engage or not engage on this issue. Michael, let me just quote Wesley Snipes in New Jack City. Mm -hmm. This is bigger than Nino Brown. Right, right. This, this, this is bigger than Nino Brown. And 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 we we probably have to go into about several bonus episodes in order to get <laughs> really get into the, new, the nuance and the idiosyncrasies uh, around party affiliation and and, and and all of those complexities there. But it's, it's it's exactly what it is that you said. Look, let me also say this as well. I've realized that you know crisscrossing this country doing criminal justice reform trying to create a pathway to freedom uh, for folks who are uh, justice impacted. I realize that Republicans at their best believe in liberty and Democrats at their best believe in justice. And all of us as Americans at our best should believe in liberty and justice for all people, which includes those who are overseas, which includes those who are disabled, which includes those who are in a, in a, a justice uh, impacted category, all American citizens, that's what we should be believing, liberty and justice. We cannot have liberty if we are not voting, and then we cannot have justice if we are not voting for all people. That, that, that is, I, I'm just going to let that sit there marinate because that's exactly the point. Um, and, and Michelle, in, in the disability space, um, you don't run into the party affiliation issue that that um, that you see with the work that Lewis is doing. But you have those other issues that we talked about that create those lanes um, that go to dead ends. Um, what are you seeing out there now in terms of as we're getting ready for this upcoming election? Uh, what are states doing to create greater accessibility? Um, you talked a, a little bit about, uh, you know, Role, you know, when you go up to a, a precinct, what is a, a disabled person likely to gr be greeted with, and and how is their access being considered uh, five months out? It's a great question. As we're sort of charging whether or not we're ready into a major election, and I do think that access is improving. It's very slow. It's far too slow. Uh, but it is slowly but steadily moving in the right direction. I think the further we get into this election, one of the things that really concerns me these days is that I think that we fail to include people with disabilities in the electoral process in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. uh, even if we made all our polling places fully accessible and we had fantastic technology in the polling place for folks to use to cast their ballots if they need it. And we solved all these accessibility problems and we had fantastic poll workers who were ready to provide accommodation to people with disabilities. All of it is meaningless if people with disabilities don't show up to cast their ballots. And people with disabilities are, as you said, one of those forgotten communities. And part of that is that candidates and campaigns and parties don't talk about us or mm. think about us. 
or see us and we're not included in their platforms and they're not talking to us and they're not talking about us and people with disabilities feel very much that they're excluded from democracy, right? Talking about liberty and justice for all, we're not a part of that process. And so people with disabilities have to feel like their vote has meaning, that there's a purpose, that it matters who gets elected because that person will see them and think about them and what it is that is liberty and justice for people with disabilities to be able to live and work and have meaningful lives in our communities. And I think that's where, where we're really failing right now. Uh, access is one thing, but access having meaning is, is another thing entirely. And we really fail to uh, integrate people with disabilities into community life and into the democratic process in a really meaningful way. Uh, that's 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 well said. It's a beautiful uh, point because um, there's so much, you're so right. I, I'm thinking back now, uh, you know, when I was a county chairman here in Prince George's, um, you're absolutely right. And I'll, I'll raise my hand and go, my bad, because we did not give much consideration, you're right, much consideration to the disabled um, in, in the sense that, and, and here's the thing, to be very honest about it, when someone says disabled, what's the image that pops up in your head? I bet you, I bet you nine times out of 10, it's someone in a wheelchair. Wheelchair. Yeah, that's what, that's, that's what happened to me. Yeah. It's also frequently a, a white man in a wheelchair. A white man in a wheelchair. And 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 we don't think about the other ways in which someone is disabled, which means they're unable uh, to do the thing that you're doing and that you take for granted. And that is, I think that's such a profoundly important point because a lot of it goes to, as we, as we spoke with, um, um, the idea of the felon and and how that part needs to change, how we visualize that, uh, that Lewis was talking about. The same is true in this space. Uh, how do we visualize the disabled? And if you just think it's a white man in a wheelchair, <laughs> then the individual uh, who is uh, the, an African-American who's blind is going to have a problem. Or the the you know the the mom um, who uh, has other disabling um, situations is going to have a problem. So that that's an important piece in order to fill out what we're talking about here, and is how we visualize and how we understand what being disabled is. And the same is true with being a felon. I mean, you you touched on it. Uh, Lewis about, you know, it's, you just can't begin to segregate out and go, well, you know, this crime versus that crime, you know, although I will admit that's going to be, that's going to be a harder, harder case to make, my friend. You, I, I think you know that uh, because it's been coded in um, an automatic no to rape and murder. Uh, felons who committed rape and murder. And, and what we don't, a lot of us kind of think that those individuals are locked up for life. That's not true. That's not true. I, there are murderers who have 14 years, 15 years, 10 years, you know, for manslaughter or whatever, they come out, boom. Um, uh, same with rapists. So it's, they do come back into uh, society. They are reintegrated. And that's going to challenge the conversation, I think, down the road, very much to your point. So Susan, I'm going to give the last last word to you, um, and I'm going to I'm going to frame the question to you this way: How do you avoid the politics? How do you avoid um, whether it is providing services for our overseas uh, military and and American citizens abroad, or grandma uh, down the street uh, avoid the taint of partisanship and politics? Because uh, I know in this environment, that has got to be very, very difficult. And as I said, you do your work with a blindfold on, earplugs in, and your hands tied behind your back when it comes to politics. Um, folks, I can tell you, um, Susan's very, very careful about that. But help people understand, you know, why you do it the way you do it so that they can trust this system, whether they're living in Arkansas or California. 
um, that trust has to be there. Right. And that, thank you, Michael. It's been an objective from the outset. I don't think overseas vote would have blossomed into U.S. Vote Foundation if we hadn't been absolutely fixated on nonpartisanship. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what? I found it pretty easy. Uh, not because I'm good at compartmentalizing, but you know, I can get to my own politics another time. Right. It's it's actually liberating because I don't have to consider that in what we do. I mentioned I came out of the technology space. I looked at the voting problem for everybody. How do we make this accessible for the guy in the military conflict zone or the student who's abroad for just a few months um, during the election or somebody who's living overseas totally embedded in another culture now? Um, all of those questions needed to be answered with um, an accessible online solution in our case. Uh, and we did it. We did it, and then we brought it, the absentee balloting expertise to the U.S. population and so forth, have moved forward from there. But it did, in a sense, uh, keep my eyes on the prize, mm -hmm. which is the number of people participating. And you know, in the course of this conversation, Lewis has said some things and Michelle some things that I really just really appreciate and need to come back to. And, you know, one of them is the talking to us mm -hmm. issue. I, I, I hadn't thought of it in terms of voters with disabilities, uh, justice impacted voters. Are lawmakers addressing those populations, reminding them that they can vote? We feel that all the time overseas. There are millions. Do people know that there are between four and five million voters overseas and less than 10 percent of them take advantage of an online modernized voting program, which I would say is probably the best that we've got in America? Overseas voters only have to file one form and it, uh, it'll register them and request their overseas ballot together simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And it's available online. Gosh, you know, why aren't they using it? Guess what? Probably for some of the same reasons that disabled, uh, that voters with disabilities and, and justice impacted voters aren't voting. That we, as you mentioned, Louis, not knowing, mm -hmm. not knowing you can. There are these invisible barriers that we've got. Uh, in fact, we made a page of myths versus facts for overseas voters. Overseas voters often think that they need to own property or have a, even a mailing address in the U.S. No, you're not in the U.S. You just need to know the address you moved from or your parent moved from. That's your voting residence. They think, oh, they're going to be reported to the IRS. You know, no, you're not. Um, and it just goes on and on. We have a whole page of these. There's the whole issue of ballot counting. Oh, I'll vote from abroad, but it won't be counted. That's not true. People don't know it's illegal for every for a ballot not to be counted, that for an election to be certified, every ballot must be accounted for. Yeah. So there are these invisible barriers, and they're different for each one of our groups. And you know, I do hope that the Yes campaign makes a dent in that. I think we share that. We really mm -hmm. share that. And um, you know, we're fortunate now that we have information. We have programs that are online. What we need is this outreach to get people to use them. And we need our elected leaders and candidates to speak to our audiences and say, hey, get online and look it up. It's it's there to be found. You know? And one of the things you were saying, Lewis, that really made me think too, on this assumption and this myth versus fact. Do people know what, you know, the impact of a misdemeanor is on your voting rights? It isn't. There isn't an impact. People with misdemeanors might assume that they're disenfranchised. No, they're not. Sometimes people can even vote from jail. Do they know that? Maybe not. And it goes on and on. So I'll just encourage people to go and 
check out the resources we have on US Vote Foundation. They're there for these voting groups. And yeah, let's keep this conversation going because I think it just says wonders to put the, there is such a fabric, an interwoven fabric. You were bringing that up, Michelle, about this overlap, this matrix overlap of how we fall into these, these groups. Do people know that 38 million Americans, one in six, I think it is, consider themselves disabled as having a disability? That means it's like your friend, right? Mm -hmm. So many of those disabilities are invisible. And um, yeah, they might be felt, they might be inside, but you don't see them. It's not the guy in the wheelchair, like you were saying. So anyway, I'm just going to encourage everyone to vote. Use the services we have. Use us as resources. We three, four that are here, and um, let's this. Let's just make sure everyone knows this election is as important as it can be. I really appreciate that. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all three of you and the work you're doing right now. Um, while identified in a particular area or space, it is all connected. Uh, it is all connected. And uh, I think the last part of this conversation really shows that connection. Um, and, and the idea uh, that those disabilities aren't just being in a wheelchair, they're, they're mental, they're internal, they're, they're based on, uh, you know, being incarcerated. That's a disability um, if you're in that space. Um, and understanding that connection is important. Um, and even, even being outside the United States, voters can feel that they are at a disadvantage. And, and what you need to know is you're not. You're on the same level playing field as someone who's sitting here in their backyard um, uh, here in Maryland. Um, you can still access that ballot. You can still cast that vote. Uh, Lewis Reed of Returning Citizens Voter. Uh, I love it. I love that work. Michelle Bishop, Voters with Disabilities. Um, and Susan Sunak. I think I got it right. Did I get it right? Close. <laughs> she just said she's she just give me a, a just show me a little love of no overseas, <laughs> over, overseas voters, um, usvotefoundation.org and overseas vote, uh, US overseas vote.org. Thank you all for coming in uh, and sharing uh, the work that you're doing. Um, follow Lewis on Twitter at Lewis L. Reed. Uh, Lewis L. Reed, yep, two E's. Two, two E's. Uh, follow Michelle on Twitter at Michelle, two L's and Michelle uh, votes. And uh, follow up on their work, returning citizens voter voters and voters with disabilities. Um, and certainly the work that we're doing at Overseas Vote, uh, it's important for you to get the information, empower yourselves. But then in the process of empowering yourselves, folks, empower yourselves to deal with those lazy ass officials out there uh, who legislators who are creating obstacles and blocking uh, opportunities for you to access your franchise and to exercise your franchise that is duly given to you under the constitution regardless of your status, right? Um, and, and so you need, to, you need to access that information and utilize it to empower yourselves because no one else is gonna do it for you. Um, and that's the work that both Michelle uh, and, and, and Lewis are doing specifically. And certainly the work that um, Susan is doing more broadly to encapsulate. We're in all 50 states. Uh, this work is not just isolated to one part of the country, it's across the nation, um, uh, and it really is trying to level up the conversation to give everybody access to the ballot box. Thank you all so very, very much for your time. Thank all of you for, for joining me on this uh, uh, conversation um, with uh, Louis, Michelle, and Susan. Uh, until next time, uh, get your act together, access the information you need, participate in the system is the only way it's going to change. Get your get your ballot vote. It's that simple. <laughs>
right? Not complicated. And um, I'm going to keep reminding you. I'm going to keep reminding you to do that. Take care, everybody. Until next time.